Hi, everyone. This is Sima Lieberman, The Inclusionist, with Everyday Conversations on Race for Everyday People, where we bring people together to have conversations about race. If you've ever wanted to have a conversation about race, but you were afraid to do so because you were afraid of either saying the wrong thing and getting attacked or being trivialized and ignored, then this podcast is for you. If you like what you're here today, please go to www.raceconvo, convo like conversation, www.raceconvo.com and download more episodes. And if you really, really like what you hear today, and you want to help keep us going, please share the show with at least one or two other people and help us get our message across of eliminating hate, stopping fear of differences, and spreading love across the globe. If you want more of me, contact me at Sima, S-I-M-M-A, at SimaLieberman.com. Hit me up on Twitter, at The Inclusionist. If you would like me to come and speak at any com- at conferences or meetings or facilitate meetings, or if you want to just be find ways to be more inclusive and have more inclusive leaders, then contact me, Sima, at SimaLieberman.com. I am so excited about my guest today. My guest today has had a career at the highest level of public policy and politics at the state, federal, and international levels. So he's really important. His name is Jeff Legg, and he has been featured in Political Magazine, The New York Times, USA Today, The Washington Post, The Hill, Washingtonian, even Fox News, Roll Call, Bustle, Forbes, and I don't know, everywhere else. Um, he, now he's the executive leader in technology. He's, he's an executive leader in technology, where he's vice president of public policy and external affairs for Rhino, a fintech startup working to give renters everywhere greater financial freedom through affordable insurance options. Meaning, finding alternatives to giving security these security deposits that are really expensive that stop people from getting places to live. He has previously served as a deputy cabinet secretary for California Governor Jerry Brown, my state, where he oversaw homeland security and natural disaster response and other parts of government. So I am very excited. So Jeff, how are you doing? And where are you now? Are you in New York? Where are you located? It's such it's such a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited for our conversation. I'm based here in D.C. here. So uh, D.C. has been uh, a really interesting time here, especially as Congress has been wrapping up their negotiations on uh, bipartisan infrastructure. Uh, it doesn't have the same uh, energy that the Trump administration had, but maybe that's uh, for the best for, for how we're moving forward. I mean, I've got a lot of questions for you, really, about <laughs> what the heck what the heck is going on this but I know, but today we're, we're, we're really focusing on stop, stopping Asian hate. And I see that you penned an opinion piece uh, for Political Magazine saying, I thought I knew how to succeed as an Asian in US politics. Boy, was I wrong. So tell us, give us your thoughts, what's happening. I mean, the, there's been such a qualitative increase in attacks against Asian people. So let's talk about that. Yeah, you know, uh, a year ago, right? So last March, um, you know, I think we were completely overwhelmed by the country going to lockdown with uh, COVID-19. Um, but there was a second thing going on at the same time, not just from a public health uh, and pandemic issue, but also there was an, a real hate issue. And unfortunately, you know, my family and friends were experiencing sort of more, maybe the word I'd use is initially weirdness, uh, you know, that January, February, when um, there was rhetoric that was talking about, um, you know, the Kung flu or, um, you know, the China virus, there was some scapegoating. And if you think about American history, and you look at Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the country, there's been a long standing history of xenophobia and discrimination. You know, uh, Chinese Americans and Japanese Americans have been here since the 1850s, right, building railroads going across the country to California, for example. Uh, Japanese Americans, uh, you know, really setting up shop in the Bay Area, for example, where you are. Um, and, you know, they face significant discrimination. Uh, so that is something that's been around for quite some time. And if you fast forward, if you look at American history, there have been instances where 
uh, whenever there are issues in the world that affect Asia and the United States, there has been a direct moment of uh, disdain, disagreement, and unfortunately, acts of hate and violence that have happened. And for me, uh, you know, and I'll tell you, you know, the story goes, I was traveling for my last work trip before the pandemic really laid in. And I was walking through an airport, <laughs> doing my darndest to get to the airport because I needed to go to San Francisco. And a woman came up to me. She spit on my face. And she told me to go back where I came from. And uh, as a proud Californian, I want what I wanted to tell her was, yes, I'm, I'm excited to go back to California. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah. I miss Mexican food. Unfortunately, she meant it in a more literal way. She meant, yeah. you know, based on what you look, I know you're not from here. Go back to China, essentially. I'm Vietnamese American. That's a separate issue. But uh, I was scapegoated specifically for the virus, spit on in front of uh, people in a public place that was federally regulated. And, um, you know, being spit on is something that's really debasing, demeaning, dehumanizing. But that's not the issue. The issue is, and this is partly the conversations I know you've been leading, it's about creating environments that allow for that to happen. And unfortunately, yeah. there were about a dozen people who saw what happened, and not a single one of them did anything. Not a single no one. one. No one said was, a word. Not a single thing. They pretended it never happened. I made a joke. I got to my gate. I flew to San Francisco. And um, it made me think, if it's happening to me, it's got to be happening to a lot of people, right? And that was the case, that in the United States, we had significant anti-Asian hate. And I know you've seen videos of, especially in San Francisco and New York and other places, yeah. of senior women being targeted because they're Asian and having the crap kicked out of them on video. And guess what? While people were watching, um, bystanders did letting anything. this stuff happen. And as you know, and I know in your conversations, I have loved, I'm so glad we're connecting. It's, it's your silence that is complicity. Mm -hmm. And that's not just for Asians, that's for all communities, right? Of color or of creed. And yeah. um, for me, when that happened to me, um, I thought the natural reaction as an Asian American in the country is I need to let it go. I need to go back into my little hole. I need to let it just not happen. Just, just, it's my fault, actually. I had deep shame. But later on in the year, and this was the turning point for me, which is why I wrote the piece, right, uh, was that my parents, so my parents are, you know, classic American dream story, right? They were refugees from Vietnam. They lost everything during the war. They were supporting American GIs. The Americans left. They were in refugee camps for six years. They made it to the United States, to Long Beach, California, with nothing. Started a small business which then became a pretty successful business, which they sold to then run another business in Georgia where they are now. So they've been running a pretty notable free range chicken farm in Southern Georgia now for the past 20 years. And they built these relationships with, you know, with coworkers, with employers, with business partners, with community members, their friends. And at the height of the pandemic, you might recall at the end of March, uh, there were three places on earth that were completely overwhelmed with COVID-19. The first was Italy, the second was New York City, and the third was Southern Georgia. A outbreak had happened following people going to a funeral. Well, wow. that funeral was about 20 minutes from my parents' farm. And a lot of people died. I think 500 people passed from that. So think about that. And think about, this is middle of nowhere, right? This is three hours away from Atlanta. Think about their access to healthcare. Think about their access to means. Think about their opportunity for education. And these were well-meaning people who they knew my parents well and respected, or so we thought. And these were the same people that told them that they couldn't associate with them anymore because they brought the virus there. Never mind that they were Vietnamese American, never mind that they broke bread with these people, never mind that um, they called it home. And instantly, they weren't neighbors, they were strangers. And they weren't strangers, they were the enemy. And that was, you know, my parents are some of the toughest people I know. And to hear wow. the level of hurt in their voice when they talk to me about it, as a, their son, I knew I had to say something. So that piece, you know, um, that piece you reference was a year later 
But the piece um, that I wrote in the local paper was about the contributions of immigrants during COVID-19. So immigrants were running small businesses. They were uh, serving as key nurses and doctors in rural areas like the ones my parents were from. And they were, uh, by the way, doing research and development for the vaccine. It's immigrants that do that. Right, work, right? that's right. And that piece came out in the local Albany Herald, first time I'd ever written for public consumption. Um, and two things happened. One was it got published and a lot of people read it, despite the fact it is a tiny publication with maybe distribution of 30,000. And the second thing is the neighbors apologized. So the neighbors apologized? Yeah, isn't that crazy? And this yeah. is during the height of the election, by the way. So this is during the election. So you've got to imagine people aren't exactly fired up to apologize for stuff. but. Um, it showed to me that people are willing to listen if you speak to them directly with both fact and heart. And that's when I started writing. Um, if you fast forward to the piece you referenced in Politico in April, one of the reasons why I needed to write specifically about my story in politics is there's this notion, right, in politics that you're in this ivory tower, you're this like palace, and you know, you're you're in the elite. So, uh, you know, you, you, you don't have to worry about these issues, but actually it's like any industry that you've advised, right, on, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, belonging, right? It has systems and processes and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, human conversations for human people with human structures that were clearly human and imperfect. And being one of the few Asian Americans in politics and even less than one hand, being an advisor to the most powerful, largest state in the union, 40 million people, right? Um, I thought I, maybe I would be immune from some of that, but I wasn't. Uh, I was treated like very much a second-class citizen despite rank and title, right? right. Uh, and those experiences, and I think it's similar to many of the other discrimination aspects that you hear about in corporate America or in nonprofits or other groups, um, is sort of this uh, marginalization in the system. So I wanted to talk about those experiences I had being one of the few Asians in politics, somehow thinking I could navigate, but actually I really couldn't, that there were ceilings, there were uh, structural barriers uh, that I was failing, but it wasn't for not trying to succeed. Yeah, that's, that, that's what's must have been so hard for your parents. I... You know, an, an anti-Asian sentiment in this country, I mean, it's not new. There was the Chinese Exclusion Act. I can't remember what year that was. I mean, 19th so century. century, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so there's been a whole history of racism or scapegoating of Asians. So, I mean, there always has to be a scapegoat, right? Because I mean, there were some people who were trying to say that Jewish people, that, that COVID was started by Jewish people. I don't mm -hmm. know where they got that one from no uh, no idea uh, yeah. uh, but if you have a, if you have hate you know you look for it and donald trump and his vitriol i think that contributed so much to people wanting to blame somebody and not really wanting to look inside the united states you know i had when covid first started and before it was here i mean it was here but before we knew about it i had these two young chinese kids staying at my house. They actually, they weren't, I mean, they were kids. They were like, I don't know, 20. And they both, but they both had degrees in, I think like science and economics. And they had been here for a while, but they lived right near Wuhan and they couldn't go back to China. So they ended up staying with me. They predicted, what blew me away yeah. was they predict, I mean, the young kids, they're saying, they said, okay, here's what's going to happen. They said, if the United States doesn't do something about it, it's going to come here to the United States. It's going to start destroying the economy. They said, it's already going to destroy the economy in China because people aren't going to have jobs. Um, and they said, and since, and since schools are closed, uh, people aren't going to be able to like do businesses like right around the schools. I mean, they were saying, and if the United States doesn't pay attention, the same thing's going to happen in the United States. And what really blew me away was that every single thing that these young people said happened. And, um, you know, because they just, because the United States decided they really weren't going to do, well, you know, Trump and all those other people, they decided they weren't going to do anything except blame Asian people. We're going to be Chinese people no. in this country, like, you know, with all the racism, it means 
Asian. And at the same time, there were all these like kind of new tensions with China. So I'm wondering where that plays into it also. Well, I think that's a, I think it's a really insightful perspective, right? I mean, when you look at global competition with China, that definitely is having an effect in our domestic politics and discourse, right? Uh, this is not the first time that's happened, right? Um, and I'll, example, I'll give you, you know, a, a more recent example in the Chinese Exclusion Act, right? Um, you know, the year I was born, right, 1982, uh, Vincent Chin, um, I, yeah, right. Uh, I mean, a, a Chinese American out for his bachelor party in Detroit gets mistakenly identified as a Japanese American by two disgruntled white guys in the automobile industry. And they kill him on the grounds that the Chinese are taking over their way of life or that they're taking away their economic prosperity, right? Again, being mistaken for being Japanese. Right. Um, so that was only 40 years ago, right? Think about that. Not that far. I mean, think about 9-11 after 9-11 happened. Um, you know, what happened with Muslim Americans, but also Sikh Americans who were thrown into that um, place of the other. So it's not a surprise. And it's an unfortunate thing because um, unfortunately the distrust of China vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese Communist Party is a bipartisan issue. It is something that both parties feel uh, concerned about. And if you look at the Chinese Communist Party's actions on genocide, on um, the way they sort of do business in the world, uh, I can understand their level of concern. But here's the thing. People talk about this in shorthand. And they say, they don't say Chinese Communist Party all the time. They say China. And right. when they mean China, sometimes they mean Chinese people. And when they mean yeah. Chinese people, they mean Asian looking people. And yeah. that then that becomes me being spit on in an airport. Yeah. Right? So these, so words matter. And actions, and actions create sentiments that don't just go away either. I mean, it's also the thing of wanting to place blame outside and also needing an enemy and wanting to feel better than somebody else. I think that's where it happens too. So you have the United States has tensions with China. Um, because of Trump, like this, what looked like we're, you know, getting into trade war with China. At first, it was just like trying to be like buddy buddy. Yeah. Um, then there was no more buddy buddy. Um, and then you had like white supremacists. They want to blame somebody. So it's always easier to blame somebody who's not white. It's always easy, easy to other somebody. And I think that's what, and, and so those messages, and in my mind, you know, those messages get, they're in the atmosphere, you know, they're in the media, they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. And even though when you see like uh, pictures of like people, Asian people being attacked, it's not always white people. I mean, there's been like black people who've been attacking Asian people too. A lot of those people are mentally ill. And somebody said, yeah, but it's just mental illness. I said, but where are they getting the messages? They're getting those messages. The messages start, to me, from the white supremacist mindset. Well, I will say, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, and there is a nexus with mental wellness, for sure. But um, you know what I find really concerning is that people will use an instance of a Black person attacking an Asian and saying, look, this is happening. Black people are attacking Asians. Right. And they're perpetuating this trope, right? It's a misinformed trope. Actually, the data would reveal that three fourths of the incidents, the acts of hate, are caused by white people. I know yeah. you're not surprised by that, but I know others would be. So it sort of neatly fits into this narrative, right? And as you know, uh, there's been long standing tactics and strategy to uh, point communities of color at each other. That's right. Uh, in a method of divide and conquer. And guess who benefits? white supremacy. So yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think it's very convenient that that narrative happens in certain media circles. Uh, it's rather alarming and concerning and also just not true. But I will say one thing I did want to highlight, and we should talk about this particularly, is you know during the pandemic, just how much more Asian women were affected. And I say this as a man, I, I, I have certain liberties or experiences that just are not the same as my Asian American or Pacific Islander um, women counterparts. But you know, um, stop AAPI hate 
you know, sort of a consortium of organizations that are collecting data and self-reported data found of the 6,600 cases that happened, you know, during the pandemic, more than two thirds came, were acted against women. And here's the thing, that data should be much higher. That number should be much higher because of cultural reasons, because of language barriers, and also shame. Um, I'll give you a couple other factoids uh, since you live in California here, but the California Attorney General, um, I guess two months ago, found that hate crime from 2019 to 2020 went up 107% wow. against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Um, overall, but here's the thing, overall hate was up 31% for all groups. So yes, it's, uh, in fact, I, there's just a lot more hate in the air. Yes. But 107% in the most diverse state in the country with the longest history with Asian Americans, I find pretty interesting and really horrible. Well, can, can you talk about the, the, the stop Asian, what is it? Stop Asian hate. Could, could you talk yeah. about that? Yeah, I mean, Stop API Hate uh, is a civic organization umbrella group that works with multiple uh, civic organizations across the country. They try to track uh, information and data related to hate, right? So they'll issue reports about groups that are affected. So, you know, one example was that during this experience here, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders had higher rates of mental health issues. No surprise. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right. And, um, so, you know, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders were facing not just bad incidents and not just being worried about the pandemic and their livelihood. They're also worried about their, their own mental well-being and their safety. And I would say, you know, I want to highlight two other groups to you beyond women. Um, the first is yeah. seniors, you know, seniors um, who have been disproportionately affected and uh, like many seniors doing COVID-19 isolated because of health reasons, and that creates a very bad situation. Um, but more importantly, because people know seniors were vulnerable, they were hiding. And so these seniors are sheltering in place for fear of going outside to public places, which by the way, the two places where the most hate's happening, public roads, walkways, sidewalks, and then places of work. Those are the two places where most of this stuff's happening. And so these seniors are staying in their house. They're not leaving. That was how my next think, question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and, and, yeah, and how do you think uh, we're doing with vaccines to them? Not easy. Some of them are doing it, some aren't. Um, you can imagine what the impact is on potential death by suicide circumstances. Wow. Right? That's something that there's an uptick in. And then I will also say... Um, related since we're talking about the rest of our country and the economy reopening as the economy is reopening asian american small businesses are still struggling now some of that is because they weren't able to access capital during the worst parts of the pandemic absolutely but it's also because these these businesses mainly small businesses are reopening and then they're getting vandalized I so was let's just say, say that they've been there's yeah. been a lot of defacing and vandalization of asian yeah. businesses so so imagine you get your ppp loan you use it to get going again, and someone trashes your place, what kind of uh, collateral or money do you think they got laying around? Not so much. It's a real problem. So how do, you, how do communities, how do families survive when they are dealing with pandemic life and life of hate? Those are the two twin things that are killing them, if not for their health, for their economic livelihood. You know, um, the whole mental health issue, you know, I was thinking about how, and, and it's a lot of times, it's, I know it's a lot of people are, it's a lot of older people that are being attacked, a lot of older Asian people because they're mm -hmm. vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So it, my, when I had somebody on my show, a uh, young Asian woman, Michelle Miao, and she was talking about the fear that a lot of older Asian people have about just going out and going shopping. They're, uh, they're not doing very much, uh, is what I've seen here. And I want you to also think it's not just older people too, um, it's also young people, right? So young Asian Americans, uh, you know, elementary school age, and there's gonna be a huge debate about kids in school. Wow. The pandemic. Yeah. But kids were being bullied. And so kids weren't wanting to go to school. 
So how do you think that, um, so who takes care of these kids if they're at, at home? Probably the mom. Yeah. Uh, and guess what? Then how does the mom get back to the workforce? They probably don't. But by the way, they probably have to take care of their elder who's scared to go outside. Who does that? Probably the mom. Yeah. Probably the daughter, right? The aunt. Yeah. yeah. So it has a, an effect where women, but particularly Asian women, are not being able to get back to normalcy in the same way, disproportionately, right? Like we want to all move on from this, of course. But how do you move on from this if you're likely to be the longest group of people that can't get back into the workforce? And it's not for not trying. It's just, it's your kid. Your kid's at home. Your dad or your mom, your senior mom, they're at home. It's culture. You take care of them. But how do you take care of yourself if you have all that pressure on you? That's hard. And I mean, and it's terrifying. And when I think about it, yeah, we, we I mean, we, we, we're like right because we had the history of anti-Asian, you know, what Chinese Exclusion Act, everything that's happened since then. Um, Vincent Chin and Vincent Chin was the only, not the only one because there's a lot of attacks. Yeah. And then we have, a, we had a president and his supporters co-signing every single thing that he said. So would it have been different if, say, if Biden had been president at that time or, or Obama? I mean, what impact do you think? See, I think that the, the Trump thing, I think that had a big impact because I think it, it said, hey, it's okay, it's all right to, to, you know, to bully, attack um, Asian people because it's Chinese people are bringing us this virus. Yeah, I, you know, I would say, for first off, the, it's hard to say just how much uh, a different political figure would have changed the dynamic, largely because the anti-China sentiment was still growing in our political discourse anyways. Uh, I think Trump, uh, the president, exploited some of that yeah. and then weaponized it accordingly. But who's to say that that sentiment wasn't already there, right? People knew that this virus had originated in, in Wuhan in some way, right? Um, and the competition between the United States and China is not going away and was pretty prevalent, right? That probably wasn't gonna change. But also uh, the point is if it wasn't one person, it'd be someone else that would have encouraged it, right? It would have been another um, public figure, media figure, right? And as you know, when people are discovering hardship and darkness, uh, they sometimes run with bad ideas, you know? Um, I don't think all of these folks who did all these things were horrible people but it's pretty clear that uh, they were heavily influenced by other forces, right? Uh, and certainly in a place of probably personal despair for them. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't change the fact that what they were doing to a group of people is horrible, but trying to have more empathy and perspective to say that they were probably having a hard time too. I mean, I have to say, there was one, that, there was one video that I saw it was an older Asian man. I can't remember where it was. He was sitting outside his house and these young boys came up and started robbing him. And yeah. his son came out and kicked their butts. Yeah, I saw okay. that. That was great. You know, and I have to say, I was really glad to see that. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, there is a growing movement at a local level for... Um, self-defense instruction, I would say. So civic groups or the local dojos, right? Particularly in terms of educating and training seniors or other vulnerable groups in self-defense, there is a growing interest in that, you can imagine, uh, and certainly a need, um, especially as things um, open up more. Yeah, I mean, I, I believe in that. I really do. I mean, and I think that we have to protect our most vulnerable people. So what do you think, what do you think some of the solutions are? Yeah, I mean, you know, first and foremost, um, you know, I, I think, so I would split it into three, right? There's the bucket of what government should be doing. There's the second, which is what organizations and businesses should be doing. And then the third, which is what you and I should be doing. You know, as citizens, right? As as fellow compatriots, right? So maybe talking about government first. Um, okay. 
I think first and foremost, you need to invest real dollars to real services and education. Let's just start with that. So, um, you know, in California, uh, where you are, uh, the governor and the legislature signed over $156 million um, investment in Asian communities. How much? $156 million. So, you know, that's not a little bit of money. That's a lot of money um, relative. Um, that's a good step. And, and they focus on a couple things. Um, the first is on better collection of data, better analysis of, of Asian communities, because one of the challenges that um, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders have is they're viewed as a model minority. And oh, right. Yeah. Yes. Um, and it's, um, it's unfortunately quite a trope because it's used all the time as a wedge to say, hey, you other group, you're not like those Asians. You're bad. They're good. But as we just talked about, you can be Asian, but you can go from being Asian to being spit on in an airport pretty quickly. So your, your standing is conditional and arbitrary. And um, so much of that, though, is to try to educate people on the real facts on the ground, which is, yes, if you collect all the data on all Asian groups, it reveals probably a higher high school or college graduation rate. It probably does reveal higher, um, uh, you know, economic success in the home per capita. However, if you break the data apart with more precision, you'll find that other groups, but particularly new Americans, so Lao Americans, Vietnamese Americans, um, you know, Hmong Americans, for example, um, they have lower rates of high school or college graduation. They have less access to healthcare. They have higher instances in the criminal justice system. And they have lower life expectancies. Figures that you would attribute to other groups and some of these figures are on par or if not worse than other groups that you might be picturing in your mind. So to help people understand that it's not like every Asian person's a doctor or a lawyer here, right? Yeah. Um, right. That's not the case. I mean, my parents are chicken farmers in Georgia, for example, right? Like there's, um, it's so easy intellectually just to paint everything with one brush. And so, you know, policymakers in California said we need to invest more money in data and information and collection of this information. That's a good step, right? Uh, there is more investment on, um, you know, on outreach, on bystander training, like we talked about, right? Working with civic partners to teach people and teach others uh, what you can do if something horrible happens to somebody. That's certainly very important too. Um, investments in ethnic media so that you can reach people you wouldn't get to otherwise, especially, you know, some who don't have um, English language proficiencies, which means they can't deliver government services to them in the same way. We need to have more education to these groups. So those are a couple of factors the government should be doing, absolutely. And with more precision, I would say, uh, California certainly um, provided a framework for that for hopefully a Biden administration and Congress to consider that down the road, particularly as it focuses on women, seniors, and small businesses, right? There was some relief towards, um, you know, economic relief for little Chinatowns, Tokyos, little Manilas, Korea towns. There were some beautification projects, for example, right, to invest in. So there's a couple things the government could do. Um, at the company level, though, like, like I had highlighted earlier, a lot of the discrimination and acts of hate were happening in the workplace. So I do think that the fortune companies and other groups have a obligation to create a truly inclusive environment. But uh, that doesn't just happen, as you know. And I know yeah. you've advised many companies on this, right? So yeah. I'll give you a couple of examples of things that I would tell uh, fortune companies to do and things I've had conversations with um, business leaders about. Um, you know, the first is just thinking out loud that it is shocking just how um, little these pipelines look early on. So there's a lot of blind spots in recruitment. 
Um, you'll find, for example, you know, women make up 52% of the population, but somehow are not in these roles or not even considered for these roles. And I'll give you the example that I know really well, which is in cybersecurity, right? Very few women are in are selected for cybersecurity roles. It's not because there isn't women in cybersecurity. There are. It's just that they're not in the, the system in the same way. And think about if you're a multinational company and you want to do cybersecurity and you've purposely or indirectly not considered 52% of the workforce to consider for these tough jobs. And imagine if you're trying to take on or respond to bad situations from bad guys, right? You need people with different life experiences and perspectives. Imagine hiring the same type of person for the same type of challenge. Imagine the blind spots you would have with that. Oh, yeah. I find that a little limiting. Um, and that conversation. A lot limiting. A lot limiting. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, I mean, that conversation, at, not just at the leadership level, but also at the board level. You know, and I know we've talked about this, that, you know, women, but also women of color needing to be in the director's ranks because it's not just because they provide better outcomes for ESG goals, but also they offer insights that a lot of their male peers just don't have. And think about the wealth that the wealth and success that creates for the shareholder and for the company. So that's what I would say at a high level, right? In terms okay. of recruitment. Um, I encourage and I try to tell many HR organizations about carving space to talk about Asian American history. And uh, I'm so yeah. grateful that you've talked about the Chinese Exclusion Act and other instances. Very few people understand that. Uh, I tell companies to sort of carve out space to have authors, AAPI authors come and speak, right? That's not crazy to share a life experience and perspective. Um, I think related um, companies should be encouraging people to share their stories, you know, yeah. their American story super yeah. important. Uh, there should be cultural trainings because as you can imagine, coming from an Asian culture, it's just a different vibe than it yeah. is in other places. Uh, and, then different, be, and then different Asian cultures are different. Correct. And so there is curriculum out there. Um, there should be, as you know, anti-racism training, like we talked about the bystander training and Asian Americans advanced justice uh, are a great example of a group that does great bystander training. Um, I think personally, there should also be, um, you know, DEI issues should be directly connected to your goals and promotion metrics. Oh, yeah. Uh, in fact, I think they should be tied to your bonuses altogether. Yeah. And that, if, and that if you decide to join a DEI council, you should be paid for it because that's absolutely, real. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the vast majority of companies do not pay for it. LinkedIn is an example. They've committed to paying their DEI council members for the work. That's they good. Should. They should. They should. They should. Uh, you know, and then, oh, yeah. And then I'll say one last thing, mentorship and sponsorship, doing everything you can to encourage an environment that um, allows people to be heard and seen and invested in on a one-on-one -on -one level. So those are some examples from a company level. Um, and I would say at a personal level, last thing before we, I know there's many things for us to talk about, but uh, you know, everyone should be, you can vote with your feet, right? Go support a local business because these local businesses have been hurting more, right? Go talk to an Asian peer about issues. And I initially was cautious about that recommendation because certainly when some of the worst of black life, you know, some of the worst of the George Floyd's murder, you know, our black friends were probably pretty exhausted but actually in Asian communities, it's an interesting thing to reach out because Asians are so not used to being reached out to. So actually it's actually a pretty interesting opportunity to educate. It doesn't have the same exhaustion. It is exhausting, but it's not the same. So, you know, go support a local business, talk to an Asian friend, right? Give to a group. I don't think that's crazy town. I don't think that's crazy. Either. I think that that makes a lot of sense because I think that a lot of people really aren't even aware. I mean, that somebody can have like Asian friends, but they may not even know if the person Filipino or they Vietnamese or they Chinese. They don't. They don't have those conversations, and they don't. 
talk to people about what their experience is or or yeah. or the fear or what's you know how they're being impacted by anti-Asian hate because they say stuff like, oh no, I know it doesn't bother you. Oh no, you're okay, it yeah. doesn't bother you. Yeah. So I think we need to look at that. And also um when you talk about anti-racism training, yeah. I think it is important to to also include the experiences, the Asian, different Asian experiences, because mm -hmm. people need to really be aware of that. I mean, I remember, see, I remember, because I'm a lot older, when Vincent Chin was killed. Yeah. But I also remember, um, like, in the 70s, and probably in the late 60s, yeah. 70s, and, and even 80s, there were a lot of organizations that were like third world, they were called third world unity groups, third world coalitions, and they were made up of, of Japanese, Chinese, Filipino. I mean, they were like, because each Asian group had like their own group of people and Black people and Latino people. So there were all these groups together that were working together. And we had a lot of more Asian authors speaking and doing book readings. And I'm not seeing that. Well, I, I think we'll be seeing more of it. I know I went to a, you know several demonstrations for George Floyd, and there were a whole there was lots of groups saying you know Asians for BLM, Asians for BLM, and I thought that that was really good. But I do think that we need to have more of that kind of we do need to have more of that education, more of that um, kind of unity because there's seems to be more of that that kind of unity and organizing. I don't want to say it stopped, but it kind of it it. Maybe it did kind of it, it did stop. I think as different people became more economically, you know, rose up economically, had more opportunities, and other people didn't have opportunities. But people don't know about individual Asian cultures. Like a lot of people know nothing about the Hmong culture at all. Yeah, and um, I would say too the I'm so glad you highlighted the importance of cross cultural solidarity, right? Um, and during Black Lives Matter, uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders you know, through Pew and Gallup and other groups found that Asian Americans were highly supportive of Black Lives Matter at the, some of the highest levels, right? Yeah. And actually those numbers haven't gone down as much as it has in other groups, for example. So I want to make sure I highlight that, that there's that understanding of the shared struggle as a struggle together, right? And that does allow us to be more um, willing to fight together and fight more effectively, more importantly. Yeah, I think that I think that that's where people's safety comes in. Is when people get together mm -hmm. like that. That people who are being bullied, I mean, have to be able. You know, once people come together and find unity, then there's so many more. You know, like in numbers. You know, it's like I know with a lot of the anti-Semitism um, going on, that we have more more unity, like a like Jewish, black. Asian people, like in, in my synagogue, they're doing some a program on anti-Asian hate, which I think is is really important. And plus, you know, you have and Jewish people aren't all white. You know, we have Jewish That's people right. who are like Asian and and mm -hmm. black. There's more uh, people of color who are Jewish being born. Um, but I just think that that unity and coming together is really important. And, and I have a question for you. In terms of, I know you were spit on, but how did it also impact? your feelings of safety? Uh, you know, <laughs> um, I only went outside at night to do a grocery run quickly for the first year and a half. And only in the middle of July did I go outside to go outside at night. So it took me 17 months. Um, you know, I did two tours in Afghanistan. Um, I've been in a number of circumstances that were complex and potentially volatile. Um, what I felt for a long time was sort of a slow burn um, PTSD. That's yeah. why I would describe it to friends. It's something I'm, I honestly, I'm still a little embarrassed to say. Um, when I think about how much worse people have had it than me, for example, Asian women that were murdered in spas, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actively targeted by a gunman. That's not my experience. White, white, yeah. white supremacist yeah. gunman. Uh, you know, um, a few weeks ago, um, you know, I was walking from a work meeting 
you know, afternoon, cup of coffee. I walk back and two men come up to me and they say, hey, Buddha, how uh, can I rub your belly for good luck? And luckily, my response is I could at least make a joke about it. And I said, well, um, I'm not a genie, so I don't have any wishes to give. So maybe you should save your energy for someone else, but ideally not anybody and walked off. But that was three blocks from my house. So this thing is a constant thing. And even if that was sort of seen as uh, maybe non-threatening, it could have been. Well, it could have been. It could, that's, how, like, that's how things start. Things start yeah. with like a little bit of a, hey, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And then it escalates and it gets worse and worse and yeah. worse. And people die. People get killed. Yeah. And as you know, in those circumstances, who you know, the, um, the, the law enforcement folks arrived to the scene, who is at more risk? So I have to factor all that in. So my decision is to defuse the situation, even though, even though deep down, I'd really love to say other things, uh, you know, that I prefer to comment about, but instead I'm trying to take the higher road because if there's escalation of things that could be really bad for me and my family. Yeah. Not for them, not for them. Yeah. You know, what do you think, I know what I thought, like when I saw, you know, at January 6th, mm -hmm. I saw some Jewish people. Yeah. I, I Like, I'm like, what the heck are you doing? I'm not, I understand that they're like some like very right-wing Jewish people who like supported Trump because of the whole yeah. Israel thing, you know. Um, but still, I'm like, wait a minute, all this evidence and your, all the anti-Semitism, but you're, but the white evangelicals have like this Israel thing. So you're going to just support whatever they do. It doesn't matter. I know. I mean, I, I can't even tell you what I thought because <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to curse it on my show. But what did you think when you saw, like, you know, there were several Asian people there. What were you, what, what, what were you thinking? Um, first off, you're highlighting a, a deeply personal moment. Um, you know, January, you know, I live about 15 minutes from the U.S. Capitol. Oh, wow. Here in D.C. And earlier that morning, you know, I live in a, an apartment building that's near a hotel. And so I saw a number of out-of-towners that were there that were, you know, pursuing their right to publicly assemble. And uh, it wasn't maybe the most friendly of crowds that I've seen. Um, I'm sure it wasn't. And when things happened, it was a deeply disconcerting feeling, especially for, to a place that I had spent years working in, you know, when I worked in the yeah. United States Congress, places I walked through, you know, and sort of walked in awe, you know, of our history, of our country, of our, you know, this like democratic experiment that we're still figuring out. Um, the place that means so much to me uh, was being um, violated in a way that I, I just, I could never imagine really. And I think many Americans felt that way. And, when you looked at the video of what was happening, um, you probably also saw not just wide varieties of people, but you also saw all these flags, right? There are like these flags from different nations and different expressions. And for me, I stopped. I remember stopping in my tracks when I saw a South Vietnamese heritage flag, which is a flag that the Vietnamese diaspora in the United States uses. It represents sort of freedom and liberty. And, um, you know, it represents a, 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 a history that was lost uh, once communism won in, in Vietnam, right? So it's a deeply personally connecting symbol. And to see that flag waved around um, at the Capitol at an insurrection seemed so contrary to what the flag stands for for so many Vietnamese Americans. It really shook me. And I would say more importantly, it really shook my parents who you know, we owe the United States everything. I wouldn't be talking to you if not for the United States. Yeah. Um, you know, I think about how much, you know, their dream of being here was to give me and my siblings the opportunity to do whatever they want without fear. And suddenly here we are faced with people waving this thing in front of you to try to perpetuate fear. It was pretty crushing. And I will tell you, um, I haven't said this to anybody, not even family, but the vast majority of the hate mail I get from 
my writings come from a lot of Vietnamese Americans. Wow. Yeah, you didn't even mention the hate mail. I didn't even know about that. So I get lots of hate mail. Um, I get a lot of hate mail. Um, and it's really hard when it's from people that you have a cultural connection from who call you a communist and never mind that I work for a tech company, right? Or, you know, they call you a, a socialist or, you know, never mind that you're actively in a capitalist system, um, right? right? Um, you know, they call you a you know, un-American, even if you've served overseas for your country. Um, it, it's a deeply personal subject. And uh, unfortunately, I will say a number of these uh, rioters decided to also hop our fence. Um, and so that was a deeply uncomfortable moment. So it was a very in-your-face time. And um, it's something that uh, when I think about why I speak and why I write and why I talk about issues, I often think about some of those images that that you and I've just been talking about. Yeah, I'm looking at the time. I mean, I could really talk to you more. We'll have to talk more about this in another <laughs> show. Um, what else would you suggest that, like, an individual listening to the show could do? Like one, like I had this young one woman who was um, Lao who was on the show, and I said, "What do you think people could do?" And this was like several months ago, right in the middle of the pandemic. And she said that if you know any older Asian people, offer to go shopping with them because they might be afraid to leave the house to go shopping. So, so as in, in, so as for individuals to say, hey, I want to do something. What should people do? Because a lot of times people don't know what to do, so they and they do yeah. nothing. Yeah, they, um, they do nothing. Yeah, you know the big. I would say there's three really big things uh, that we haven't covered. Um, so the first, I think the first one is. Um, if you want to learn about our history, it's so important. The I tell everybody, including Asian Americans, watch the PBS documentary on Asian Americans. It's really good. And it gives you a good overview of sort of the history, the struggle, the legacy. And it'll help inform you on sort of how things are today and why. Everyone right. should have that baseline. Well, Ideally, to watch it. Gotta do it. Gotta watch it. Okay. It's great. It's a it. great opportunity. Um, the second thing uh, that I think is super important. Um, is to, uh, you know, do your due diligence to follow, follow news in uh, our politics. Um, you, you don't have to um, be a, an activist, but just follow the trends and conversations and ask yourself, where is the representation? Just take notice. Because you know, even in the United States Congress, there's not exactly a ton of communities of color represented in the same way. Um, keep that in your mind because you have an opportunity as maybe coming from another group where you have a voice and a power to eventually have, a, to be able to speak up for others, to be a more active co-conspirator, right? Rather than a bystander who does nothing and you watch someone get spit on. Yeah. Don't yeah. don't be complicit in that. Education on those issues are important. And the third thing uh, that I think is so helpful, um, and it's the hardest one, is having conversations with your loved ones and family. That is the hardest conversation you will have. It's so easy to talk to a stranger about politics or issues in this country. It's even harder when you have a conversation with someone you really love and you really disagree with. But the United States needs to do more of that. We need to have more conversations with loved ones. Wow, this is great. Thank you so much. Uh, is there any, well, you said about the history of Asian Americans on PBS, any other books or films that you would recommend? Um, you know, Charles so Yang. Um, yeah, well, let me think here, actually. Um, yeah, I mean, Anything Charles Yang, anything Viet Thanh Nguyen, anything Ocean Vuong, those would be amazing uh, readings there uh, for you to check out. Any of those would be a joy. Uh, I think they have audiobooks too, if you want to listen to it on your on your uh, public transportation rides as well. And I'm reading this book, Serve the Pe to Serve the People, which is really good, which is great, and it's about um, Asian American activism, and it talks about the, I mean, the whole history of discrimination against Asians. It goes into all the different groups also, and how groups have pitted against each other. So 
talks about the 60s, the 70s. I'm still late up yeah. into the late 70s. Yeah. So I think it, it's a really good one. And also, I suggest people watch the documentary if they can find it, Who Killed Vincent Chin? Oof. Yeah, it's pretty heavy. Um, it's pretty heavy. I, but I, I, mean, it is, I can't watch it again, but it was pretty Yeah, I, absolutely. If you've, if, if you've got the um, emotional fortitude, you should totally do it. But I would say the PBS documentary is something that I think will give you a, um, a broader overview first. Uh, I, I would definitely recommend that as an entree. And learn about the and learn about the different Asian cultures. I mean, that is so important that people do that. Also, um, Helen Zia. Anything by Helen Zia? Anything by Helen Zia? She's fire. Uh, yeah. I mean, amazing writer and storyteller. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the list can go on. There's so many yeah. Asian American Pacific Islander um, authors and journalists and and um, thought leaders. Absolutely. And I, you know, so if people want to get in touch with you, how do they get in touch with you? I'm, I'm going to put the links in the show notes, but say somebody says, hey, yeah, I want to talk to this guy. Uh, you know, I mean, my Twitter, I try to be as active as I can be at Jeffrey D. Lee. That's Lee with one E. Um, and I certainly respond to a number of the messages, even if they're hate messages. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I, I love the opportunity. That's where I usually uh, push out my latest contents or writings and um, I hope I can share with you more writings as we keep in touch. Oh, absolutely. I'll put them on my website too. So um, thank you so much. So I'm just going to close the show. So just hang on for a second. Yep, okay. Of course. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Jeffrey, I, I really want to thank you so much for being on the show. It really meant a lot. And that, that you're willing to share so much. That's really, really important. So Everybody, this is Emma, the Inclusionist with Everyday Conversations on Race for Everyday People, where we bring people together to have cross conversations about race. If you like what you hear today, please go to www.raceconvo, convo like conversation, www.raceconvo.com, and please download more episodes. Please share the show with one or two, at least one or two other people. We want to get our message across about spreading love across the globe and stopping hate. And again, if you would like me to bring, if you'd like to bring me to your organization to facilitate a panel, to consult with you on inclusive leadership, to facilitate the conversations on race, please contact me, Sima at SimaLieberman.com. And you can hit me up on Twitter, Sima Lieberman. I mean, on, on Instagram, Sima Lieberman, or Twitter, at Sima Lieberman. Or you can find me on LinkedIn also. Until next time, Sima Lieberman, signing off.